Hi, I'm Aaron Marcus. I work as a botanist for Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department in their Natural Heritage Inventory. I also work for Green Mountain National Forest as a botanist seasonally as well. I work mostly with endangered plants, uh, but mostly we're going to be talking about common woodland plants that you can find in your woodlands around your house or in central Vermont or hopefully at North Branch Nature Center if you live nearby. So here we found a really big patch of violets and this is actually the common violet, Viola sororia, that you've probably seen in gardens and such um, and in lawns and the wonderful thing about violets is all parts of the plants are edible so um, you can actually go out to your garden and pick some for salads that includes the flowers as well as the leaves. Um, generally eating wild plants can be really really nutritious part of our diets so the other cool thing about violets is that they have these flowers that um, you see right now that are open and that will be pollinated by insects. But they also, later in the season, most violets will actually produce another set of flowers that you don't even really see uh, because they don't actually really have petals and open. They actually are just flowers that they produce and then they self-pollinate and then will produce more violets that way. So this is the open pollinated flower and later they'll have self-pollinated flowers. So they'll do both. If you look later and you'll see they're producing seeds and you're like, how are they producing seeds? I don't see any, you know, they don't seem to be flowering anymore. So they'll do that. It's sort of, I think for some plants, it can be sort of a way of ensuring they're still producing seeds. If, you know, they're a lone plant or something, they can still, um, still be producing more seeds that way. The vi all our violets in Vermont are gonna be purple or white or yellow, generally, flowers but there's maybe about a dozen species that you'll find on the landscape. The other thing, while we're here, I don't know if we're gonna find better examples of this. So this is Dutchman's Britches, maybe we will. They're just finished flowering, but you probably saw them earlier um, with that. They'll, they will actually go dormant very shortly. They're what we call a spring ephemeral, meaning that they are ephemeral. They just, they just grow in the spring before the trees really leaf out. And then by the time they go to seed and go dormant, um, it's, you know, June or July. They, um, they don't stick around too long um, in the shade. Uh, they just get their reproduction out of the way really quickly. So anyway, you can recognize Dutchman's britches by these white flowers that um, have these little, they look like upside down shorts, like they're wearing upside down shorts. And then these leaves, they look a little bit like bleeding heart leaves. So we are sitting in a field of lots of plants, actually. I'm sure the first thing that probably pops out is all these dandelions. But what I actually wanted you to notice were these beautiful strawberries that are in flower below everything else. If you see all these white flowers down here, these are all wild strawberries, Fregaria virginiana, or Virginia strawberry. They are a very common plant in Vermont in fields, also sometimes in the woods but you'll especially find them abundant sometimes in old fields. Um, and as many of you probably know, they're very tasty. If you come back and visit these flowers in June, I think it would be June, yes. So if you visit these plants in June, the fruits are actually really cool. They're a bunch of fruits that are actually fused together. So each of those seeds you see on the strawberry, on the ripe strawberry, actually is an individual fruit that just merged with all the fruits around it. And if you haven't read Braiding Sweetgrass, there's a whole chapter, this is a book by Robin Kimmerer, and there's a whole chapter devoted to wild strawberries. And I really love Robin Kimmerer's relationship with strawberries. So I definitely recommend that book. It is, um, it is the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department's read I think this month or around this period right now that they're inviting people to read. <laughs> this tree is a mussel wood and you can tell mussel wood because they have these sinewy branches and limbs that look kind of like mussels. They kind of bulge out in funny ways. So especially if you feel this tree or if you hug this tree you can feel how this tree is a mussel wood. Mussel woods are in the birch family so you'll see the leaves. The leaves you can see that the leaves look a lot like birch leaves, very much like birch leaves. If you just saw that, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But you can tell by this very distinctive bark. And mussel woods usually grow in places that have usually rich soils. And this part of North Branch, this is the place with all the wildflowers, has 
very rich soils that um, are very high pH and allow plants to get a lot of nutrients, which is what this tree likes. Another thing that we have here, besides this muscle wood and all these beautiful sprouts, is grapevines. And we have about three native grapes in Vermont, but this is river grape. This is really the most, by far the most common grape you'll find in central Vermont, in this part. And they have these beautiful vines that look like the sorts of vines you'd want to swing on, but I wouldn't want to hurt this grape. And they have edible fruits. You can actually eat all of the grapes in Vermont. You need to make sure they're actually grapes if you're eating them. But you can definitely eat, you can definitely eat the fruits. Uh, this river grape actually has very small fruits. There may be, there may be a quarter the size of a commercial grape. Uh, and maybe half of that is seed, but they're still very tasty. They're not as, they're not big like the fox grapes, which are more like a conquered grape looking grape, which grow in warm, warmer parts of Vermont. This plant is one of the greenest plants in Vermont. So I love it in the spring when you look out into those wet areas in northern Vermont, central Vermont, and you just see these huge wet areas just covered with this plant. Uh, this plant goes by a lot of names. Um, usually false hellebore is the one I use, um, but there are other names for it too. Sometimes locally people will call this plant skunk cabbage, which is a little confusing because there's another plant called skunk cabbage, which grows in the same habitats and also makes these wetlands green, but is really more of a southern Vermont species and, and Champlain Valley. So you won't generally find skunk cabbage much up in central Vermont near North Branch Nature Center, but you will find this false hellebore, uh, which is a much more upright, tall plant uh, like this, where you can see they have big stems. Skunk cabbage will be all on the ground without stems. Uh, sometimes also when, when these plants are smaller, people can mix this plant up with ramps. And you definitely do not want to do that. This is a very toxic plant. Thankfully, it's not hard to tell this plant apart from ramps. One, because they have these big stems, you can see. But also these leaves just have these really, really thick veins. Um, you can just see how veined they are. They, they're even, they're sort of wrinkled with veins, like someone sort of crumpled them up. And wild leeks are going to be pretty much flat leaves. So that's a pretty easy way to tell them apart. One more thing about this plant is that they have these incredible green flowers. They, they look sort of like tiny, tiny lily flowers. And many of you, you probably haven't noticed them. But this year, since many of us are spending a lot more time outside, I really invite you to watch these plants over the next month. Uh, it's really around the beginning of June, they're going to form these amazingly intricate green flower spikes. They look like these tiny little green lilies, and it'll be this big wand, and it's definitely worth taking a peek. So, you probably know what this plant is. You may have even eaten this plant. This is the wild leek, or ramp. They come out really early in the spring, one of the first things to come out, and you'll just see rich woods sometimes in parts of Vermont will just get covered with wild leeks. Especially in places in this part of the state, especially places that have, you know, the Waits River bedrock, if you've heard of that bedrock. Um, rocky woods, and also rich floodplains like this one. And they come out and grow. And then right now they're already starting to go a little bit dormant. They're getting a little wilty and the leaves are turning a little bit yellow at the edges. And maybe about a month from now, the plants are really gonna be yellowing a lot, but they're gonna be sending up flower buds. So this plant is unusual in that they send up leaves and then the leaves are basically almost gone by the time that they're flowering and then fruiting. You can actually see if you poke in some of these leaves at this time of year, you can actually just see some of them right between the two little leaves, there's just a little flower bud that's starting to stick up. That's going to flower soon. Now, if you want to harvest leeks, I would make sure you go to a place that leeks are abundant because you definitely can, um, this is a plant that can definitely be over harvested. And especially this year, I think it's important that we all have food security, that we're all eating and getting the food we need. And it's also important that these plants survive. So one thing you can do is just pick the leaves and not the bulbs, and then the plant, that same plant, is able to grow again next year. That can be a, a good way to, um, take, to um, support the population more. So this is another violet. Earlier we saw the common purple violet, which actually grows right here. 
but now we're actually seeing another violet that grows in generally just in richer woods and this is the hairy yellow violet myola pubescens pubescens means hairy and they have these beautiful yellow flowers and unlike this purple violet here these plants actually have their flowers on a stem so you can see there's actually a stem with like leaves growing up the stem right here um, which is uh, something that some of the violet species do and others don't so that's a really good thing to look for if you want to identify a violet is does the violet have a stem or is the violet just growing right out of the ground uh, so anyway here's the yellow and the purple violets right next to each other and this one is called the hairy yellow violet because the stems are actually very hairy for many folks i think jack in the pulpit is is a favorite plant uh, many people think that jack in the pulpit is endangered in vermont jack in the pulpits are actually not endangered in vermont however actually there is a species of jack in the pulpit that you've probably never seen that is threatened in Vermont and that species is called the green dragon. This is not the green dragon. If you were seeing the green dragon you'd probably be in the Champlain Valley in a floodplain forest on the Champlain Valley uh, and you would be seeing a much larger plant and this little spathe which is this little thing inside the jack in the pulpit flower would be so long it would stick out of the flower probably like all the way up to here and it would be a greener plant and these leaves rather than having three little leaflets they would be like fingers of your hand kind of like that the an amazing plant you should definitely look that plant up but this is the common jack in the pulpit and you can find them anywhere with moist soils in the woods in vermont you just have to look look for them sometimes they're really small and if you were to look inside of a jack in the pulpit flower, you can see actually where the berries are gonna form. They form red berries in the fall. It's actually way, way down at the bottom. There, those flowers are actually way at the bottom. And something that's really cool about jack in the pulpits is that they, are, they typically will change sex during the course of their lifetime. Uh, they're, they're not the only plant. There are actually, there are plenty of plants that do that. Uh, dwarf ginseng is another plant that will periodically change sex, I think. One study I was seeing said that 25% of the plants in a population changed sex, changed sex in a year. Um, and I mean, often when we're saying change sex, it mean, might mean that they're changing from being one sex to being both sexes. Um, so uh, it, just, it just goes to show how variable and creative and, and uh, diverse nature is when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, sex, just like humans. Many of you have probably harvested this plant or eaten this plant. This is the ostrich fern from which we harvest fiddleheads sometimes. This is what the fern looks like last year. So that can actually be one thing you can, that can help you identify it is these upright plumes from last year. In fact, I don't know if you can see that, but as I touch it, there's actually still spores that are shaking off into the breeze. This plant actually, these plants are actually still maybe at harvesting size. A lot of the fiddleheads in the last couple days really sprung from the warmth and are growing really, growing mostly unfurled. But these ones are still unfurling in these beautiful shapes. The other way you can tell ostrich fern once they're unfurled is they'll form these big ostrich plume leaves that might be about two, three feet tall. And those, uh, those ostrich plumes are, I guess, where the name ostrich fern comes from. They will be green and stay out until maybe uh, September. They, they'll they'll uh, go dormant a little earlier than a lot of the other ferns. One thing that's really neat about ostrich ferns is just how they come up intermittently at different speeds. So you might find one patch of a site like this where the ostrich ferns are really still small and just emerging. These ones, this one here, they really are just starting to emerge and then you'll find other plants that are full grown at other places and I don't actually know exactly why that is uh, it probably has something to do with them they're probably measuring something I don't know if it's when they were last flooded or what temperature it is in that part of the woods but certainly you can see this in different parts of North Branch how they space themselves out one plant you might confuse our beloved ostrich fern with is this fern right here this is the interrupted fern why is it called the interrupted fern? Well, because some of these fronds, like this one, have 
leaves that are normal leaves at the bottom and then in the middle of the frond interrupting the frond they have these spores on these middle leaves and then as you get up toward the top which isn't unfurled yet they'll have um, more normal leaves again so normal leaves spore leaves normal leaves so the spores kind of interrupt the middle of the frond which is really cool so take a look at those when they unfurl these grow, interrupted ferns, similar to fiddlehead ferns, grow in wet areas. So they'll be in a lot of the same places. Uh, you do not want to harvest uh, interrupted ferns. You don't want to harvest cinnamon ferns either, which look similar, but they're going to have spores up the whole frond. Uh, you can tell most easily probably the interrupted and cinnamon ferns because they have really hairy, kind of scaly brown stems. While you can see the ostrich fern has these really clear green stems. They will have these sort of brown choppy scales that come off, but they're not, they're not woolly. Like these are kind of woolly in the way that they're on the stem. I know we're mostly talking about really showy wildflowers. This is a wildflower that's not very showy, or it might not be very showy to you because the flowers are green. This is a grass. In fact, this is a, uh, one of the bluegrasses. Many of you are probably very familiar with looking at Kentucky bluegrass, which is one of our common lawn grasses. Despite the name Kentucky bluegrass, they're actually a native plant to Eurasia uh, that's introduced here. However, this is actually not lawn grass, so you may get that first impression. This is a wild woodland native grass that's related to Kentucky bluegrass, but this is a native grass uh, called Poa elsodes. And one thing I love about this grass is the way uh, these grasses can grow really well in the woods on their own, but they do really seem to like human paths. So we kind of help them out. And you can see here, if you look back at this path, you can just see how they really kind of follow this edge of the path really tightly. I don't know for sure why, but usually plants that follow paths like this, it's usually has something to do with um, that. Well, they're very tolerant of trampling because uh, they can just pop right back up or just send up a new shoot, just like mowed grass can. And they also probably, they might benefit from the increased, um, decreased leaf litter. Like, because we're walking on this path regularly, the leaves get pushed aside. And so they may benefit, I'm not sure about this, but they might be taking advantage of the more bare soil here to germinate initially. Also, while I was just talking now, I just noticed a little nut on the ground. And you might find these at North Branch Nature Center. They're pretty rare to find these days. This is a butternut. Um, and the reason they're rare to find these days is because our butternut trees are mostly diseased with a canker now. There's uh, an invasive fungus that's been uh, killing the great, great majority of our butternuts. But occasionally you'll find healthy ones still, um, and hopefully some of them will survive. Some of the trees here at North Branch Nature Center are still producing nuts, so that's a really good sign. Usually if you want to go looking for butternuts, the trees, uh, Usually going down to rivers, floodplain forests and rivers in central Vermont is a great place to look. Uh, you will also find them up on mountain slopes and such where the soil is really rich. Uh, uh, but rivers, because of the constant flooding each year, brings in new soil and keeps the, can keep the soil really rich too, so they like that. Um, and if you see, if you're driving along rivers in Vermont this, um, these days, you'll often see lots of dead snags, and many of those are butternuts that died in the last 10 years. Um, I really love these nuts. The squirrels clearly do too, because this one has been eaten. Uh, they are edible, but I wouldn't recommend eating butternuts anymore just because there are so few nuts that are being produced that I think they need every nut they can get.